So there's other things, I, I could go on and on about all the different things that are happening, but right now that idea of spiritual renewal, and in fact we had someone who called me and um, he said, I need to talk to the church on Sunday. And then, oh, about what? You know, hopefully it's not about me. He goes, no, 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 it's not about you. Uh, but he goes, I was in a horrible car accident this week. Like, Nick, show the picture. This is, this is John Hendrickson's car on Thursday. Uh, that's on the 405 right by the Getty Center. He was coming down the 405 in the carpool lane. Someone came across all the lanes of traffic, basically pitted his car, turned it over, hit it against the K-rail, and then he slid across. Other, it ended up being a five-car pileup. Uh, they couldn't get out of the car. If you saw him, he has one scratch on his wrist from that accident. He was coming home from a ski trip in Mammoth. He said, I want to get up and tell the church that I know on that day and in that moment, God was there for me. That's all he wanted to say. He wanted to get up and tell people, I wanted to tell you what God has done for me. And so I'm sharing that with you because that's part of his testimony. And it's something that each of us needs to become familiar with, the practice of being able to say, this is what God is doing for me. Now, the nice thing about offering testimony, if you're a witness, whether it's a criminal case, a civil case, a religious case, is you don't have to be responsible for the whole thing. There's a lot of loose ends in life. There are a lot of questions people have. All you have to do is say, this is my testimony. You can believe it or not. You can see it's valid or not. And when people have other questions, you just go, well, I don't know about that. I can just tell you what happened with me. And so John gave us part of his testimony. He goes, and it actually, then he told a couple stories about being a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, uh, similar moments that he had of feeling God's presence. And each of us needs to be attuned to that. That's why we're talking about this interior renewal and the spiritual work is because you need to be as dedicated to your spiritual health as you are to your physical health. And we say this all the time, and I've said it before to you, all of us, like I could pull up right now the Kaiser Permanente app on my phone, and I could read to you, and I know you would love, you would just be riveted by this information, I could read to you all of the test results they've ever given me what my cholesterol is, my blood pressure. I could, you know, they'd say, oh, he did this and that, and here's some x-rays, and, and I could just, I have a whole encyclopedia about me on my phone that's the aggregate of everything Kaiser's ever done that they've uploaded into my digital medical file. But if you were to ask me specific questions about my spiritual health, we don't have near as many diagnostic tools to zero in on where we're doing or how we're doing spiritually. So most of us go, well, I'm okay, or I'm not okay, or eh, I don't know, eh, I don't know. Like we, we don't have the same specificity of dealing with our spiritual health, which is why we need these moments of retreat, renewal, spiritual exercise, so that we can not fall into the problem of spiritual heart disease, a kind of spiritual arterial sclerosis. Now, one of the things you're going to find is we need to address that from what Adam read from Samuel. There's actually another reading for today from Corinthians, so we're going to talk about Paul and the Corinthians, and then we're going to talk about Jesus and this encounter. Now, the, the point of this sermon is not going to be get into spiritual shape so that you can be better connected to God. Uh, we are going to talk about being spiritually unhealthy and some of the impediments it creates, but one of the gifts of the gospel is that when we're not ready or we're not sure, God just shows up. So sometimes God will show up. But part of the problem of being spiritually unhealthy is sometimes you miss it or you don't understand what's happening even though it's happening to you. Now, one of the things that hopefully you saw in the news this week and on our social media this week is that Robin's Nest launched Robin's Landing, which is a miracle. It really is a miracle in our community that you all were able to accomplish this. And we have the Robin's Nest front row here. Um, and it's something that you should celebrate the possibility that when God gives you a dream or a, a vision and people say, well, that's impossible. Oh, that's going to be so hard. You're going to get a house in Huntington Beach and it's going to be for kids. That's, that can't happen. Not, do you know what the market is right now? Well, the house is there and it's dedicated. Now they're looking for a house manager. So if you know someone that might have the heart or the calling to now take this thing that's been created as a gift and help live it out, then talk to Robin or talk to people on the board or go to their website, actually. The job description's on there. And now they're looking for the people that will actualize. The gift is there. How do we live out the gift? So if you know anyone that might be interested, go to the website, look at the job description, the requirements, 
because it's a miracle. It's literally a miracle. In a, in a time where it's so difficult to get anything done, they got it done really quickly. It, I mean, it happened unbelievably quickly. And it created an opportunity for God to show up for me in a way I wasn't expecting later. Because I saw some people I hadn't seen for a while. And uh, I told one of them, I go, you know, because you always go to these, and you go, well, we should get together later. We should get together later. So I had this feeling. Uh, so I texted this guy I hadn't talked to in a couple months. I said, hey, we should get together. And he goes, well, I'm actually going down to beach in Atlanta if you want to meet me. I thought, oh, he's going right now. I go, well, I, I guess I could. And then the problem is, is I sometimes commit to these things, and then I regret it, you know. My wife goes, oh, here we go. You know, he's... He's all excited about it, but on the car drive, I go, why did I do that? You know, like, I'm social anxiety. So we were literally pulling into the parking lot on Beach in Atlanta, and I tell her, I go, why did I say I would do this? I don't want to be here. Even though I did, but I was feeling I didn't, you know, I have this anxiety. And she goes, oh, and for two months, I've been looking for this homeless guy. For two months. He's one of our senior citizens. So if you saw him, you wouldn't know he was homeless. We could not find, he called me while we were in Japan, asking for some help, telling me an update on his life. And when I tried to call him back, his phone was off. We looked for him at the navigation center. We asked people at the police department. No one could find this guy. And so I'm sitting there complaining to my wife, as I do, pulling into the parking lot. And I go, oh my gosh, it's Joel. No, I'd had lunch with a guy named Joel that day. So she goes, the guy you had lunch with? I go, no, the other Joel. So I throw the car in the park and I whip out and I go up to him and I go, I've been looking for you. Where have you been? And then he goes, oh, I've been here. So literally, I'd given up looking for this guy. And I go to this thing that was unplanned because of the Robin's Nest event earlier in the day. And I find the guy, or I should say he found me, that I've been looking for for literally two months. We'd had the police involved. We'd had the, all these people, and no one knew where he was. And then he just appears in front of me, and we have this wonderful conversation and embrace. And now we're getting him connected to some things he needs as he moves toward housing. He had gotten put in the wrong program and all this stuff happened, and now he's back on track. But this is what we're ultimately going to get to is in a world where it feels like things aren't necessarily working, we need to be ready for God to show up. All right? So that's something that you need to be prepared for. Even if you're spiritually struggling, don't be surprised if God just shows up. And we, that's going to be the final. I'm telling you the end but we'll get there in a minute. But it's important that we say what the point is before I get lost in the details. Now, one of the things that we find is that there are many occasions in people's spiritual and religious life where they are disappointed. And not just disappointed like with God, they're disappointed with the church. Or they're disappointed with the community of people that are the church. Or they're disappointed with people because they have legitimate hurt or people have misbehaved. One of the reasons that some people find religion to be difficult to participate in as they go, well, have you seen the people leading? Have you seen what they've done? Whether it's a sex abuse scandal, whether it's an embezzlement scandal, whatever it is. And that's the problem we have in Samuel, if you didn't know. Like, why is it that God gives this little boy this message to give to an old man about his family? Because if you remember, the priesthood in the Old Testament is families. It's a genetic thing. You don't apply, you don't go, well, I think I'm going to be a priest, and you put in an application and they test you. You had to be part of the family. And the problem is Eli has two sons who are horrible, horrible priests. So when people come to meet God, because they go, this is the place we know where God shows up. This is the place we go for things that are holy to happen. They meet these priests who are supposed to be instances of the holy doing bad things. So for example... God had set up a system where these guys could get food and security and pay off, essentially, through the different sacrifices, but under a very specific set of circumstances. So if someone offers an animal, after parts of it are sacrificed, the priest gets some of the food, and that becomes their meat. And the problems with Eli's two sons is they go and they just go, oh, forget all the religious stuff, just give me, I want a steak. Give me the best part. And they go, well, that part's supposed to be for God. Oh, forget God, who, what, just give me the steak, you know. Now, that may not sound too salacious to us. We're like, well, everyone wants a good steak occasionally. The other problem they would have is uh, his two sons were sleeping with all the different women who were working in the temple or the tabernacle at the time. And so Eli knew about it. 
He knew that his kids were doing what they weren't. He, you know, you guys are turning this place into something it's not supposed to be. And the, he goes and tells them, you all need to stop, and they didn't stop. So that's why Samuel gave him that word this morning saying, you knew what they did. They were blaspheming me. You told them to stop. You didn't do anything when they didn't. And now it's discredited the whole enterprise. So this is one of the reasons sometimes people don't think God isn't going to show up because the people in charge of the enterprise discredited it. It could be a priest, a pastor, or whoever. So this is one of the problems that we have. This is one of the problems that we see. And poor Samuel, if you remember Samuel, he's this little kid. His mom really wanted to get pregnant. She couldn't get pregnant. So she prayed to God and she made a deal with God. She says, God, if you get me pregnant, I'll give you my son back to serve you. Immediately she gets pregnant. She goes, oh, man. So there's a great detail in the book of Samuel where she refuses to wean him. She wants to keep nursing him because the deal is once he's weaned, he has to go live with God. You know, so this is probably one of those weird things where you're like, are you still nursing him? Well, he likes it, you know, like, oh, okay. he's a little old. Well, I know, I know, but I want to keep him as long as possible. So you see the grief of a mother's heart where she wants, she knows what she wants, but she knows what God wants. And there's this tension, there's this wonderful tension between the mother's heart and what God has been promised. And you'll notice that when Samuel is this little kid who gets dropped off at the temple going, or the tabernacle, here's your house now. He's like, what? Bye, we'll see, you. we'll see you once you hear when we come back for, with our offerings. All right, bye, Mom. You know. And he's living there, and he hears God's voice, but he doesn't know it's God's voice. God's voice is literally calling his name. And the spiritual character of the place has been so discredited that no one knows it's God's voice. And this is really important for us. When the spiritual health of a people is so poor, and we could say this in the United States, we could say it in California, Huntington Beach, whatever you want to say, it's not that God's not speaking, it's that people can't recognize his voice anymore. You know, so God is calling people by name, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel thinks it's the priest. He keeps waking up this old priest. He's like, dude, please. I just got into REM sleep. You know, please. You know, I wake, is, what do you want? Why do you keep calling me? I'm not the one calling you. So there's this spirit of confusion. But God keeps calling until God can pierce that so that God can take and bring it to a place of renewal. Just because humans discredit an enterprise doesn't mean God can't renew it. And that Samuel will be part of this work that will lead us to uh, the first office of the prophet and then to Saul and David and the monarchy and so on. So God may be calling your name. That's what I'm saying. But you may not recognize it as God's voice because of the climate in which we live spiritually. But it doesn't mean that God's still not going to show up. So don't be surprised when God shows up and you go, oh, I didn't know you'd be here. And God goes, I've literally been, I've been talking to you personally. We go, you have? This is why it's always in the Gospels, Jesus is healing people that can't hear and can't see. And sometimes people say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that I can hear and I can see. And you're like, no, you don't get the point. God is saying, all of you are like that. You cannot hear me. You cannot see me. I'm among you working. And part of the work is open my eyes, open my ears, open my heart. And part of being calibrated spiritually through retreat, through spiritual exercise, through sacraments, through the Bible, Bible study, is that sensitivity that we can hear and see and discern. That's why John Hendrickson wanted to stand up after his accident and say, I wanted to share what God's done for me, to give us some sensitivity and maybe ask the question, what about us? What is God doing for us? Now, there's another part of this. So I've talked about the leaders who discredit religious communities. What happens when it's the people who discredit religious communities? This is the reading from Corinthians that we have assigned for today. And Paul is talking to the Corinthians. And Paul says, look, how many times do I have to tell you? You guys got to stop visiting prostitutes. Just stop. Stop with the prostitutes. Now, I said to Pastor Brad, now, Pastor Brad has been a pastor a lot longer than that. So let's say Pastor Brad has preached 12,000 sermons over his life. And I've probably preached 6,000. So let's say we've we preached almost 20,000 sermons. And I asked him before service, how many times have you had to tell your congregation, stop with the prostitutes? <laughs> what was the number? Zero. Zero. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Funny, that's my number too. <laughs> you know, and now, not to say that people haven't done that, but to the point that someone has to address it publicly and say, you all have a problem, you all need to stop doing this. Why does Paul tell them that? 
Because what they've done is in their cynicism, and this is the problem, when spiritual communities are discredited or when spiritual health is low, we no longer think that the highest value of human community is communion. Now this is very important. The highest value of human uh, interaction is communion with each other and with God, which means having real relationships of trust, having real relationships of vulnerability, having relationships where people keep their promises to each other, having relationships that are reliable and stable. When we don't think that's really possible, those relationships get reduced to a kind of cynical commodification. That's why Paul will tell the Corinthians, he says, stop with the prostitutes. And they're like, but it's fun. Paul, why? Why are you telling us to stop? You know, and it's really, and, and this is true. You see this as a whole through line in the Bible, which is people will exchange the intimacy that you can have with God merely to just the physical pleasure that comes through sexual experience. And so Paul tells them, he calls it fornication. But the Greek word for fornication is actually the word that we get for pornography. And the word we get for pornography has in its root a sense of commercial exchange. Someone's getting paid for this. So rather than relationships of mutual exclusive trust where we understand each other, we value each other, we're vulnerable with each other, we just say forget about it, how much does it cost? So we have a friend of ours uh, who has a law firm and he had done something at Disneyland and I go, I didn't know you could do that at Disneyland. And he looked at me and he said, you can do anything you want if you pay enough. And I go, oh. I go, well, I'm not going to do that with church money, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, we're not going to get there with the church money. Uh, but he's highlighting a point, which is we have, um, you know, the Napoleon movie that just came out, he goes, everyone has a price. He goes, I'm just surprised at how cheap most people are. You know, you can buy off people at a lot cheaper rate than you thought they were because everyone has a price. So there's this idea that we take the most valuable things and we reduce them in their true inherent value to a kind of commercial exchange, including our sexuality. And so Paul is saying, and Paul actually says to the Corinthians in that passage, he says, um, don't you know you've been bought already? So he uses that language of commercial exchange, but now he's talking not about money, he's talking about the ransom that comes through the blood of Jesus. And he says, you've already been bought, you can't sell yourself, God already bought you. You don't belong to yourself, you belong to God. So live in that place of belonging and stop prostituting yourself. And this language of spiritual prostitution becomes a through line in the whole Bible that God is calling us to an intimacy that we are constantly sabotaging and looking for other gods, looking for shortcuts, looking for ways around it. And God is constantly calling us back to this exclusive intimacy, this pilgrimage of trust. And this is the whole point of the church. This is why we keep talking about spiritual health, because it matters. Spiritual health matters because it creates possibilities of trust which allow human beings to flourish. The whole goal of this is to be fully alive. And when we're reduced merely to a commodity or a commercial value, you are not going to be fully alive. You might make some money, someone else might make some money, but we are not fully alive. Now, there's one final detail, well, two final details. You're not sleeping as much as the first group, so that's good. I don't know if it's, you came a little later, maybe. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just make two, maybe three points. I'll make three points to finish. Three quick points. The first is Jesus recognizes the problem that we're discussing, whether it's being discredited by the institution itself, whether it's being discredited by a cynicism that reduces things to their commodification. When he sees Nathaniel and he says, truly, this is an Israelite in whom there is no guile. You've probably heard that a thousand times. Truly, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. The problem is, none of us ever use that word guile. When was the last time you go, oh my gosh, Julia Ludwig, she's so guileless. You know, and it, the word almost has, you know, it's positive, you think, but like, what does it mean? Well, it's funny because guile, and again, this is sort of the Greek word behind this, guile is deceit accomplished through baiting. So you hold out a bait that you think someone's going to bite down on, and then you deceive them. So when he says, this person has no guile, He's saying, this person will not deceive you. They will not bait you. I mean, if you think of the current environment in which we live, there's bait everywhere. People want you to take the bait. 
And they, that's why we have, a, we have phrases, we have words, we have news stories, we have personalities. Everywhere there's bait just waiting for you to grab onto it and get hooked. And we even use that language of getting hooked. Well, he got hooked. There's even an episode of Spongebob about that. The hooks. You know what I mean, Julia, right? No? Okay. No one knows that? Okay, I watched it. Fine, I watched it. But it's this idea, this is one reason why people are suspicious of the community that we have here at the church, because they're suspicious that in fact all we're doing is baiting them. Let's talk about mercy. Let's talk about forgiveness. Let's talk about God's goodness. Let's talk about serving our neighbor in the community. Let's talk about, but when they get here, well, that we just use that, and now here's what we're really about. This is the true secret that we couldn't tell you because we knew if we told you at the beginning, you probably won't stick around. This language of being baited and deceived, when Jesus recognizes Nathaniel, he recognizes the person who is just trying to live their life in a world with discredited institutions, reduced human dignity, and they're just trying to find their place to God. They know there's a pathway to God, and how do we find it? And Nathaniel doesn't know. God shows up. So even for the people that are trying to walk in the way that they know there's a, a kind of transcendent horizon they can meet, God still has to show up. And it's very important you understand this about the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John uses the language of Genesis. In the beginning was the word. We read that at Christmas. And you'll notice that John does this. Then John goes, the next day, Jesus appeared. John appeared at the River Jordan. The next day, Jesus is walking the next day, and if you count all the days when he says that, because he does that, and then he says three days later, they were in, it's the seven days, because John is recreating the book of Genesis, and on the seventh day is the wedding in Cana. So John is intentionally saying, at the, in the beginning, and as we walk with God, we're walking toward a wedding. We're walking toward a celebration. And this is what's so important for you to understand in your spiritual health, is that we're not just doing this without a purpose, we're doing this so that you'll be ready for the wedding. That's why all of the Advent verses were about the bridegroom coming, and are we ready, are we not ready, the bride feast and the betrothal, Mary was betrothed and Joseph, all this language of weddings, constantly language of weddings, because the Bible wants you to understand that God is leading you toward a wedding. And it's going to be a great celebration. And it's not going to be a bait and switch. There's not going to be deceit. There's not going to be prostitutes. There's not going to be people discrediting the wedding ceremony itself. It's going to be what God wanted from the beginning, and this is what we're walking toward. And if we don't know the way, this is why Jesus says, and this is the final point, if you don't know the way, he tells Nathaniel, because Nathaniel's like, wow, you saw me? That's really cool. You must be the Messiah. And Jesus goes, dude, that's not even the... Well, that's like kid stuff. That's, like, that's something small. If you really want to know what it means for me to be the Messiah, the chosen one, he said, you will see angels ascending and descending on me. Now, that's a curious phrase because it only appears one other time in the Bible, this image of angels ascending and descending, and it's when Jacob is sleeping with a rock as a pillow, and he has a dream of God, and he sees heaven open, and there's a ladder or a ramp, depending on how you translate the word. There's a pathway that connects where we're going to where we are. And Jesus is clearly saying, I'm the way. Now, he says that later in John, but he means it connected to Jacob. When Jacob's in a time of great stress, great turmoil, he wonders if his brother is going to kill him when he sees him because he screwed his brother over earlier in the story. God shows up and says, I'm going to make a way from where you are to where you're going. And this is very important that you hear this today in the church that if you're in a similar place where you're wondering about where you are and what God's going to do, don't be surprised if God shows up. But there is a path between where you are and where you're going. And it's not a secret road and you don't need a secret map. He has a name. His name is Jesus and he will show you the way. And it's the road the angels take, so it's probably safe to take for you.